Hey, I'm live. Notice in the background, I have a banner. Eventually, I might even have an office at some point <laughs> in my little house to put it in and maybe display it as I do my videos like a lot of bloggers do. They have their whole little offices set up with all this kind of stuff. But in the meantime, excuse me, in the meantime, I am uh, set up here in my bedroom. <laughs> if you knew what this bedroom really looks like, and people who know me know what my bedroom looks like. <laughs> oh, when I tell you some magic, some magic, I'd have to clean it before I would have someone come and clean it. That's how bad it is. But anyway, I call it the abyss. Anyway. This is my fourth attempt to do this video essay called Racism, Evolution, Iteration, and Revision. Uh, it was a video essay, I, I mean, it was an essay I did back in February of this year because I really believe that people need to have People need to have an understanding of what racism is, how it operates, and how it has evolved over the generations in order to navigate, especially Black people, need to know what it really is in order to, to navigate. Perfect example, my granddaughter is in San Antonio. They just had the coin ceremony. She joined the armed forces. We're not even going to talk about that part of it, because. Uh, but my granddaughter was is happy. This is what she wanted to do and she joined the Air Force. And today, I am very happy to say that she passed all of her basic training and she was, uh, she participated in her coin ceremony. Now, that being said, her mother uh, tried to get on a plane. She bought a first class ticket round trip on American Airlines. And when they got to Chicago, she got the worst treatment anyone could get. Now, I'm sure you know people have many, many horror stories, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is because for Black people, there is always racism. And unless and until Black people begin to realize that it's not just a once in a time, once in a every now and then, well, maybe it could have been. No, you need to understand that systemic racism is structural, is structural. It's built into every institution. So all of your human activity, including trying to catch a plane, is going to be affected. Now, they told her after delay, 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 and getting on a plane and being on that plane for two hours, being told that she might have to wait days to get a flight or be stranded in Houston. She happened, I want you to hear me. She happened to hear some white people on their phones complaining to corporate, complaining to the corporate offices and it hit her, hmm, they might be being racist to me. Well, huh. you think? Because guess what? She said to herself, now this is, this is my, this is Mimi's mother. She said to herself, let me code switch. <laughs> I think I need to code switch. Let me call corporate. They can't see my face. I know how to talk white. Let me get on here. She did, and she got a flight out. One o'clock flight. Got a ride out to San Antonio with the white people that called corporate. They told her She'd have to wait days. 
until she made that phone call to corporate where they could not see her face. Those arbitrary decisions of those flight attendants and those, uh, what do they call them, the coordinators, whatever, you know, those people who stand behind those desks and tell you. It's those arbitrary decisions, those are what help to grind that wheel, that mechanism. So once she did what she did, but I'm here to say to you, black people in particular, you have to see this experience, your experience with the lenses that I'm telling you, you need to put on in order to navigate. Because if you don't see, you're going to keep asking yourself these questions. Why? Why is this like this? Why, why am I not getting what I'm supposed to be getting? Wait a minute. Why are they getting on a flight that they're telling me that I can't get on? Because they're telling me that my flight doesn't, that it doesn't exist. And I'm going to have to wait days and miss my daughter's graduation. But yet these white people are falling down to the gate for the flight that they can take because they call corporate. So let's get a better understanding of what racism is and was. It's evolution and it's different iterations and its revision over time. If you can hear me, or if you can't hear me, let me know. Right now, it doesn't appear anybody is on, but that's okay, because once you do see this video, then you'll be able to share it with other people, and um, do share. Do share the video with other people, uh, anybody who, that you think might be interested. The written essay is on my website, www.cles-writer.com. Elise is spelled A-L-E-A-S-E-writer.com. Here's the fourth attempt. Let's hope the sound is good. Let's hope it doesn't turn off. Let's hope I have a good internet connection today. My computer is plugged in. You are going to need to put on your lenses and your critical thinking caps for this one. What you need to know moving forward regarding racism in the United States. The definitions in dictionaries and other sources contain only one element, one context. My other prior videos, I discussed how this language works, how this language itself operates, where you've got a thousand million connotations. I'm exaggerating, but there are numerous connotations. There are also prefixes, suffixes that add and take away from the uh, meanings of words. There are um, connotations there's any number of different expressions of a word and you should understand what they are and not just take for granted what people tell you because in this particular instance, there's only one context that r racism is defined as and it's the one that matches the flavor of racism that white and personal behavioral racial bigotry solely on the basis of one's color. And that's any color. So you need to understand that in order for this iteration of racism to work today, it has to stand with this definition. Because otherwise people would say, would under this is well not otherwise but this is why people are confused when they read the definitions in the dictionary and they say well wait a minute this basically means that anybody can be racist no anybody can't be racist and i'll tell you why 
This brand or iteration of racism also suggests a source other than the obvious white supremacist ideology from which the original system was spawned. So you need to understand that white supremacy spawned racism. Nothing non-white spawned racism. Black people did not give birth to racism. This is a white construct. This is a white ideology of superiority over non-white people. And in particular, African-American descendants of the enslavement. So this brand or iteration of racism also suggests a source other than the obvious white supremacist ideology from which the original system was spawned. And it also, this is important to understand, it also eliminates accountability and dissolves the responsibility of collective whiteness. And I talk about collective whiteness uh, a great deal, okay, because and I also, I have some of those, I uh, have it written in, in essays that explain the collectivity uh, issue that is the uh, uh, concept of whiteness as a state of being and blackness as a state of being. Black people understand to a degree what blackness as a state of being is. White people may or may not because they've been so indoctrinated over the years uh, to um, um, not seeing their whiteness as a state of themselves. Um, anyway, I don't want to digress. Of course, systemic racism contains those individual elements since it could not operate for so long successfully without them. Case in point, the experience of my daughter's, I mean, of my granddaughter's mother today it needs individualized bias. It needs the individual bigotry of white people in order to keep those cogs and wheels going. Because if it didn't have the support and maintenance of white people in their various ways of expressing it, it would fail utterly. What most people disregard with regard to racism is the what it is, not the how it operates. And most shy away from the who is responsible. Just like I said earlier, black people did not create racism. White people created racism. White supremacy is what spawned racism in order to keep itself sustained and maintained in order to keep, to keep the white supremacist ideology maintained and sustained through the generations. You have to understand that. Now, fundamentally, based on what I've said to you, I need for you to open your minds and realize that fundamentally racism is and was the systemic subjugation within established institutions in the US through structurally designed denial and limited apportionment of opportunity, equity, equality, and justice to control the formerly enslaved and their descendants after the enslavement ended. As I said in a prior video essay that no one probably saw, <laughs> Think of it as an adjunct to the slave codes. These were the original fundamentals of its creation, the backbone, if you will. 
and what continues to work hidden in the background today unabated with impunity and in perpetuity. It operates, I mean, it, 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 it is what it is because white supremacy created it to sustain its ideology. Its ideology would fail. It would fail miserably otherwise. To gain a better understanding of the evolution and revision of racism in the US or the flavor of racism blacks and whites experience in different ways today based on their own perspectives of this revised conditioning because it has been revised over the generations. It has to, it had to, it couldn't sustain itself um, during the civil rights movement of the 60s if it had not reinvented itself or retooled itself. Basically, what you should do is you should etch what I said to you as to what it is and was in your mind, consciously understand what it is and what it was. And let me get back to it again. Let me say fundamentally what racism is and was. It is the systemic subjugation within established institutions in the US through structurally designed denial and limited apportionment. Now, the was part is that there was no limited apportionment. That's the is part now. And that is as a result of the civil rights movement or what I call the economic apportionment movement. Basically, the design is denial and limited apportionment of opportunity, equity, equality, and justice. Each one of those aspects, and it's important for you to understand, opportunity, not just employment opportunity, not just educational opportunity, I'm talking about opportunity. Sometimes it's opportunity to live. Equity denial of equity. Understand what the denial of equity is. Understand that the reason why we're talking about reparations today is because of this denial of equity and continued denial of equity, not just monetarily, but in all areas of human activity. Equality. If there was equality, there would be no need for white supremacy. If there was equality, there wouldn't be any need for competition. Competition itself is so ingrained in the psyche of people today that we think that it is natural for people to compete with one another for scarce resources. That's the idea of economics in this country. Competition for scarce resources. That's a construct. Exceptionalism is based on competition. This entire structure in this country is based on competition. For what? Who's better? competition in who's better. And when you have one group of people who already say, have already indoctrinated everybody else into the belief that they are themselves superior, everyone else is competing in a losing cause.
So most people disregard the what it is, not the how it operates. And when I say that, they disregard the, the, the what it is, they disregard what I've said to you because they're so indoctrinated into and conditioned in the post-racial colorblind racism is over thing. So they don't understand what it is. And they begin to try to interpret it based on the uh, individual behavior of individual people concept, which you read in the dictionaries today, which is why so many people are confused about it in the first place. And like I said, most shy away from who is responsible. So now that I've told you what it is, I'm going to get into how it operates. And we already know who is responsible. Fundamentally, how it operates. And before I say that, I do want to point out that th there are times that when I do my essays or when I write something or I post something, uh, there are going to be people who try to expand into uh, Pan-Africanism. They expand into colonialism and colorism. And I need for you to understand at this outset, in terms of this essay, I am dealing specifically and fundamentally with this country, not any other country in the world. I am not talking about colorism based on colonialism. I'm talking about racism as it was built, designed, and how it operates in the U.S. So fundamentally how it operates. Racism operates, and I want you to listen to this. Listen. Racism operates as power plus prejudice and bigotry in the form of white Ness and white. So you've got white as a color and whiteness as a state of being as superior. You understand that? I want you to understand that clearly. White the color, which is a tool, and whiteness as their state of being or ideology as superior. This is important for you to understand. And black, formerly enslaved and their descendants in this country, remember I'm talking fundamentally about this country and the people who were brought over here as enslaved individuals. So racism operates as power plus prejudice and bigotry in the form of white as a color, whiteness as a state of being as superior, and the black formerly enslaved and their descendants as inferior. Put succinctly, the ideology of white supremacy in the U.S. That's how it operates. Racism operates through the ideology of white supremacy as power and prejudice and bigotry. By way of history, and, and when, okay, I, I put this in this essay and I don't know, every time I read it, I wonder why I put it in, but then I realize why I put this part in. And I put this part in because I need for people to understand that whiteness was a thing prior to 1960. It really was a thing. If you want to know what it was, simply look, Google for anything where white people uh, refer to themselves as white people. You won't, you're only going to get that today because of Trump. You're only hearing it 
in this new era that has been created through Trump's presidency. But prior to this, you weren't hearing white anything. Okay? So I put in how white was so common and whiteness was so common. So I wrote that by way of history, recall or research that as of the first census, the first census in 1790, and, and this is important because the first, cens first census that was ever taken in this country was in 1790. And the total population of the country was just under 4 million. Imagine that in relation to the number of people who live in this country now, but there were only 4 million in the country. And the only categories for race were free, differentiated now, they differentiated, free white males, not free males, free white males, free white females, not free females, not normal people, not normal, neutral, or natural, not free American males, not free American females, but free white males and free white females. There was a distinction distinction made back then. And that distinction was a major, major thing up until and including 1960 thereabouts, or until the civil rights movement and the powers that be had to retool and reinvent, reinvent racism as it exists as it is expressed. And I'm gonna get into that. So you had your free white males, free white females, and slaves, and other free persons. That's an interesting description. Other free persons. Certainly there were other nationalities in the country at the time who were not enslaved. But that distinction was made that you were a free white person or a free, I mean, a free white woman or a free white man and everybody else and slaves. <laughs> you didn't have Hispanic, Alaska, you, know, you didn't have, <laughs> well, you know, you didn't have the other nationalities. You didn't even have Native Americans listed in the census, unless and of course and un un unless they were part and parcel of free other other free persons. Keep in mind, however, that while there were free black people in the U.S., it is not clear if these people were counted as free persons. or even as persons for that matter, okay? This is how the construct operated and continues to operate, evolved and revised to suit generational changes, albeit in background and hidden because today You've got any number of nationalities listed in the census. As a matter of fact, as of the 2010 census, mostly all of the non-white ethnicities are listed under African-American slash black. You'll notice that in the 2020 census. Recall in the 60s, 
or research if you're born after 1968. Racism was revised as the euphemism segregation. Now, I know everybody, everybody, when you think racism, what do you think of? Segregation, separation. You think of restaurants where black people were getting juices and food thrown on them because they dared sit in the same proximity of white people because of all of the things that they showed about the Jim Crow laws. They showed that separation of the races, that segregation, the whites only, the blacks only, separation. They didn't include a whole lot of other things within human activity that Jim Crow did to black people. But segregation, segregation, mind you, that was made into racism. Segregation and integration was introduced as the only way to eliminate this euphemized iteration of racism. And indeed, many people, many, many people think, many people think that because there are shared spaces, racism no longer exists. I have to tell you, they're pretty smart. They're pretty damn smart. Anytime they're gonna make you think that the only thing that black people wanted out of this was to be able to share spaces and places with white people. Wrong. We wanted equity, opportunity, equality and justice. That's what we wanted and what we got was very different. So we got to share spaces with people who did not want to share with us. Just because we can go and, and, and eat in a, in, in a restaurant among white people that doesn't mean we're equal. That doesn't give us equity. It is a limited apportionment of opportunity, but it only provides opportunity to share spaces. We didn't ask for that. Not totally, but that was what was pushed. Anyway, I don't wanna digress into that, but that was what was pushed because technically um, that's another whole subject. This fallacy of ending the Jim Crow legalized segregation of the Southern states became the way to declare the successful end of racism in the US. Bear in mind, as I said before, when I was digressing, that segregation was but a tiny part of the subjugation of black people. It was a false representation depicting the end of denial of opportunity. It created nothing more than the, the appearance. It created the appearance of integration or allowing black people to share spaces and places as equality. It did not address true equality, equity, or justice within any notion of real opportunity. 
real opportunity. The, the ability to, the, the opportunity to live peaceably within those shared spaces was not guaranteed. The opportunity to live without the threat of abuse and terror by police officers was not included in that. To name a couple of missed opportunities. What it only offered was limited desegregation through black entry into a few institutions that were formally denied through racism limited apportionment I talked about, including the white economic caste system. Now, in addition to allowing for the sharing of spaces and places, there was also an opening into the white economic caste system. Understand that there is a separate, unequal, black economic caste system. If you ever want to know why we are paid less, typically it is because that is part and parcel of the economic system we live in. If you want to know why we have no wealth accumulated, you understand why our system of economics within the system of racism, that, that institution of economics is separate. So during the civil rights movement, they opened the doors and allowed a limited apportionment of sharing spaces and places. The space that they shared was the economic, white economic class system. And trust me, that only served to enrage white people. And the reason why it enraged them was because they were basically saying, how are we superior? How are we going to be superior? Because this is what we equate with our superiority because we've seen time and time again that we are not really, because if we were, they would not be they would not succeed despite us and what we put into place but they succeed they succeed in sports they're faster they jump higher now you going to put them in with us How are we going to be superior? How are we going to maintain this thing? If you're going to put them in there with us. They thought black people were taking their livelihoods. And in some cases, their very superiority, especially if that was all they had. If they were economically strapped, was Po, which they're more and more today, that's all they had. So they thought they were taking, literally taking, we were taking their superiority away. Nonetheless, nevertheless, integration and segregation are other subjects for another time is what I said before. Maybe I'll do a long drawn out essay on that too. Finally, how racism has evolved, how it has been bleached and revised and how it is expressed today. Today, individualized personal biased behavior of people of any color based solely on color is considered racism. Now, you know I ain't lying.
you will find most, most people who are interpreting those definitions as ascribed by the people who do those, uh, who write those definitions, all of whom you can bet your bottom dollar are not black, are going to write that those definitions such that they correspond with this iteration, revision of racism as it is expressed today. And I want you to listen to this and I want you to listen to this carefully. All non-white people are equally enjoined with white people in this latest iteration, which is the twisted white supremacist version of equality, where the oppressed are now equally as culpable for racism as their oppressors. This iteration of racism, how it was retooled and redefined made it so that equality reigns, equality reigns. <laughs> and even though you are being oppressed, you too can be racist. We're giving that to you. We're sharing, since we're sharing spaces and places, we have given you the opportunity to be racist as well. Even though you didn't create racism, even though it was created out of the bowels of white supremacy, that ideology, which is so fake and phony that it just don't even, it, it just shouldn't exist, but it does because people believe it. And that's the nature of humanity and our being. You believe it, therefore it's real. I could get into some other subjects, but I'm not gonna do that here. But those of you who just caught what I said, better understand that it becomes real when you believe it. That's when it becomes real. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I am telling you the truth. I don't look at the thing that often because I'm reading sometimes. And sometimes I'm looking at my own face just in case I, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, here I go again. I digress, but I'm getting ready to get back on topic because it's almost over. Bear with me. I'm almost done. Essentially, Color changed from simply a, as a, being a tool for purposes of identification of descendants of the enslavement to the entire basis for racism. Imagine, just imagine you're in an argument. You white, the person arguing with you is black. They say to you, You honky, you say to them, you black, you say, whatever you say, they say, whatever they say, that argument is 
considered a racist argument. Why? Because you both used racist epithets. And what that says is also because the black person used a white epithet. That means that black person's racist, right? No. Because the moment you get mad enough, Mr. White or Ms. White, to call the police on that black person, the moment you get to call the police and tell them that you are fearing for your life, all bets are off. Because the power you wield through your bigotry can get that black person killed for calling you a hunky. Basically. You think it could happen the other way around? Nope. You've already seen evidence of that. And I know you have. Because if you get on Facebook where this live is being presented right now, you know for a fact that all you got to do is reach into that bag of institutions that are built structurally for you. And you use them. Individually, when you are interviewing a person for a job, and that black person is sitting up there in his or her finest. And they present you with a resume, which is for all intents and purposes, overly qualified for the position they are seeking. And you sit there and you interview that person for an entire hour and you smile and they smile and you talk about the job and what it involves and then they leave and you go to your supervisor and say, well, she was good, but you know, do we really want somebody like her to represent our organization? It is a very visible position. Perhaps we should keep looking. We might just find someone who would be a better fit. Those are the things that happen individually that I spoke of before that help sustain and maintain all of those structurally bound institutions in America. The reason why, as I explained in the very beginning of this essay, how the flight attendant person or whoever this person was who was speaking to my granddaughter's mother and told her that there were not going to be any flights available to San Antonio until days later while she's stuck at Chicago O'Hare. And she happens to listen to a few white people talking to corporate. Oh, corporate, this is a travesty. I need to get to where I need to get to. I purchased a first class flight and I need to get to my destination. Oh, no problem. There's a one o'clock flight at gate. Yada, yada. Thank you. And as my granddaughter's mother watches these white people little by little just filing away, going down that walkway to their destination, she decides, I think I better call corporate. But let me put on let me put on my white voice. Hello. This is a travesty. 
I purchased a first class ticket and I intend to get to San Antonio. Get me my goddamn flight. <laughs> no, she was cool. She got a flight because they couldn't see her face. Okay. Sometimes we got to do what we got to do. And when you understand at the outset that it is real, you don't have to guess. You know what it is. You know that it is baked, built into the structure of this nation, every institution of human activity in this country has it baked inside and it is propagated by, supported by, and maintained by individual white people and some black. I ain't going, I'm not going to fool you now. I'm not going to tell you ain't no black people that support, that don't support white supremacy. There's the notion of just don't do me like you do them. Because I got money. <laughs> yeah, we got that. We've always had that. Well, since after slavery. But anyway, here I go again. Essentially, color changed from simply a tool for purposes of identification of the descendants of the enslavement to the entire basis of racism. Remember, it was designed for the descendants of the enslavement and the newly freed enslaved and their descendants, the newly freed slaves and their descendants. That is what racism was essentially designed for, but it didn't just disappear. It didn't just go away. It followed the trajectory of generations. Are you hearing me? It followed the trajectory of generations. It never went away. It evolved to suit generational experiences. And its systemic nature is still intact. Make no mistake about it. The very first thing Mr. Black and Mrs. Black, Ms. Black and Young Black need to understand is that this should be the first thing you think when you don't get that job, when you don't get that loan, when you don't get that apartment, when you are mistreated by the police. This is the first thing you should think, not the last thing you should think. You know, I, I, I'm, I don't generally bring religion into anything that I, that I say. I may kind of glance over it. Hold on one second. It says my battery's low. I'm not going through this. Okay, somehow it unplugged. I'm hoping that that hasn't affected anything. <laughs> it was getting ready to get stupid again. Okay. Anyway. It should be the first thing that you think of, not the last thing. I was talking about, I can see I'm going a little slow and I'm hoping that I'm not. But I probably am. <sighs> anyway.
when you pray, people say, well, ain't nothing left, uh, ain't nothing else left to do but pray. Now, these are religious people. These are faith-based people. And, and, and yet, even though with all of that conditioning and indoctrination into prayer and the power of prayer, they say, well, I guess we better just pray because there's actually nothing else we can do. Really? You're treating it that way? If prayer is so powerful, why is it your last resort? Why isn't it your first resort? So I say that to say this. It is all in your thinking. Think of what is happening to you within the lenses that I provide for you so that you understand that it's racism until it's something else. It's racism until it's something else. Until they prove otherwise. In the beginning, during the civil rights movement, and they formed the EEOC, the onus was on the company to prove they didn't discriminate. Now, you have to prove they didn't. My computer is behaving like it's very slow. It's not, there's a lag. Yeah, you could probably see it because I see it. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really beginning to think that it is because I'm doing this particular essay that I get this kind of BS because on my other ones, I wasn't getting it. I don't think that people want you to know, there are people that don't want you to know what racism really is. I don't think people want you, I don't think there are people who want you to really understand what it is because my internet connection was supposedly corrected. The issues I was having were all supposedly corrected by 3 p.m. yesterday. And yet I'm seeing a definite lag in this video. So just bear with me here because this is my fourth attempt to do this. And after this, I'm just going to rely on the written essay on my website. Understand that white supremacists now condition the masses of color with color as both the tool and the basis for racism itself. Using it to combine, accommodate and control it's non-white, it's expanding non-white demographics. See, this is another reason why it's been retooled and, and, and uh, rein, reinvented because there are more and more people who are non-white. You understand? There are more and more people that white people, color plus state of being, realize are in this country they no longer just have to contend with the descendants of the enslavement because more and more people who i are non-white color are coming into the country so they need to expand their connotation and their expression expressions of racism why they put everybody into the pot and that's why people of color 
is accepted as a term for all non-white people. And we, as black descendants of the enslavement, we just, just follow right along. Oh, yes, people of color. You don't realize that, you know, we are definitely still being singled out even while the demographic is, is expanding and the the powers that be are calling acknowledgement of this expansion diversity we are still being denied And even more so now that there are other ethnicities that are non-white to choose from, we are still being denied equity, opportunity, equality, and justice under this system. These revisions continue to succeed while in true in true vindictive fashion, it continues to punish the descendants of the enslavement who were the original targets of the discrimination. Hold on one second. Hey. Good. And I'm going to have to call you back. I'm in the middle of a video. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge you. I'll call you right back. Bye bye. That was Lynette. That was Dr. Lynette. But, and I thought she was actually um, going to tell me something was wrong with the video. <laughs> but she wasn't. Anyway, I um, am sorry. I had to take that because I thought maybe she was going to tell me something about this video was wrong. Um, you know, the lag that I see. I'm sure you guys see it. But just bear with me because it's just about over. Indeed, it is important to understand the past in order to know the dynamics of the present and to enable you to positively and effectively affect your future. You got to know how to navigate this system and you won't be able to navigate it if you don't know what it is. And I've told you what it is. I told you what it was designed for originally. I told you how it retooled and reinvented itself and how it is expressed right now to accommodate the ever expanding demographic of non-white people in this country. They got to make it fit. They have to make the system of racism fit, even among those who did not expressly experience the enslavement. So they use the tool of color so that they can pull everybody in together into the system. That's why. That's why it doesn't matter whether your ethnicity says you're Jamaican or Dominican or Cambodian. That's why it doesn't matter if you're from Ecuador or Mexico. It doesn't even matter that it's actually xenophobia, which is the hatred of people from other countries. When I learned that the synonym for xenophobia was racism, that spoke volumes to me, volumes. Why, you think? Well, just think. If you have a hatred for people of other countries and the the person who created the definition of a xenophobia and 
associated the synonym with xenophobia to racism, what are they saying to you? I have a hatred of people from other non-white countries. Because you already know what racism is and you already know how it operates. You already know that it was spawned from the ideology of white supremacy. It didn't spawn from anything black. It spawned from whiteness as a state of being superior. So if you're xenophobic because you hate people from other countries and it's associated meaning is racism as it is expressed today and defined individual behavior, you know, then that means that you hate people from other countries that are non-white countries. That's a bitch. That's something for you to think about. And as always, I want you to think I want you to think. I want you to think. You do not have to agree with anything that I have said here today. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I am not trying to change your mind. I want to open your mind. Why? as wide and as deep as the ocean, so that you begin to think deeply about the words that are used every day and how they are expressed. I want you to think about words that are used every single day that come out of your mouth and that come out of the mouths of others. That's what I want. That is my goal. That is my mission. I want you to think. And damn it, you're going to think. You may not like what I say. You may think that I am the nutty, nutty as fruitcake. Some members of my family think I am. <laughs> and friends. <laughs> Some people think I am crazy. Sometimes I think I'm crazy. Okay? My mother was crazy. The Duchess was crazy. And Albert don't fall too far from the tree. But there's a method to this madness. And that's to get people to think. To get you to think. And especially about things that you don't ordinarily think about. I'm giving you different perspectives. And then you can interpret them. And the fact that you're even interpreting what I say tells me that you're thinking about what I'm saying. That's the part that's really important. The fact that you are even giving it time to interpret and you say, no, that's not really what it is. You actually took the time to think about it though, didn't you? And that's my purpose. And see, I've always been of the belief that once it goes up into here, it stays. It may fall into your subconscious. It may fall even deeper still into your unconscious. And that's where most of the, the bias and the bigotry has fallen over time, over generations way down here in your unconscious. So what I try to do is give it to you and force it up, back up into your conscious mind so that you stop and you think about some of those things that you 
had tucked away before and didn't think about, but that they rear themselves in times when you least expect it. And you think to yourself, now, where did that come from? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why do I think this is okay to think this way? I want black people in particular to understand that racism in your experience in this country needs to be the first thing you think about, not the last thing. Not the, well, I might as well, I might as well call it racism because I can't think of nothing else. That's just like that prayer. There ain't nothing else to do but pray. No, pray first. It's supposed to be some power in it, ain't it? Isn't it supposed to be power in prayer? Well, there's also power in understanding. And there's power in understanding when racism has reared its ugly head and you know that that is what it did. Because then you can force them to tell you that it ain't and give you valid reasons why it's not. Because for too long, they've been able to skirt past that because we weren't saying it was. We were saying it was everything else, but for generations, for at least two generations since the civil rights movement, it was, well, maybe I didn't get that job because I just wasn't qualified. No, your ass was qualified. Maybe I didn't get that apartment because my credit was, no, your credit was okay. It wasn't stellar. Okay? You wouldn't get no million dollar loan like Trump. But you could get that apartment if you were white with the same credit. Or even worse credit. You better see it, see it first and force them to tell you, no, it's not. And the reason why it's not, excuse me, did I not get this job because I'm black? <laughs> oh, of course not. Well, can you give me a valid reason why I did not get this job when I'm fully qualified for it? Why not? You didn't get the job. What difference does it make if you call them out? I mean, that's not to say that they're going to give you the proper answer or any answer at all. But I tell you, it feels damn good <laughs> to call them and ask them back up and say, listen, I want to know why I did not get this job when I'm fully qualified for it. You mentioned fit, as in a good fit. What is essentially a good fit for your organization? Skin? <laughs> Call them out. That's what you do. All righty. I'm going to get off of here. Remember, share with people that you think might be interested. I noticed that the lag that was happening while I was doing the essay seems to be gone now. Um, I have been on this thing for a little over an hour. Yeah, an hour and 14 minutes. So I'm going to get off because I don't see anybody on here that uh, has any questions or anything like that. Oh, I'm seeing hearts and stuff. Hi. I don't know. I can't see who's here. It's not showing me anybody who's here. So I can't really acknowledge anybody. Uh, that eyeball over there says one person. So hello. And hello to anybody else. And hello to everybody who um, gets on this video after I've uploaded it to Facebook. I appreciate you. Do put in comments. Do share. I really want to know what you think. 
do not think that I'm going to, that don't, don't be intimidated. See, I'm not an intimidating person. Not, I don't try to be. I've been told I can be, but it's not my intention to be that way. Am I a strong black woman? Yeah. Am I a loud mouth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do I say what's on my mind? You got damn right. Yes, I do. Wait, where is it? See? Because why? Because the doctor's in. The doctor is in and has been in since May of 2018. Yeah. She been a doctor since last May. Been a year now. And I worked hard for it so that I could get on here and on my website and on my YouTube channel and give you the unbleached realizations that are necessary in this era that has yet to be named. See, we've already gone through the post-racial colorblind era. I know I said I was getting off, but I done got a second win. <laughs> Damn it. Okay, we have entered a new era. And this one promises to make or break this nation in so many different ways. Not just for black people. We're in it and we in it to win it. But I'll be damned, these white people are going are trying to trying to destroy this, this this whole planet for a whole lot of different reasons. And we have to tell them, look, <laughs> stop it. Fight for what's right. Dismantle the entire ideology of white supremacy, which means that you're going to have to dismantle that whole concept of um, competition for scarce resources. Because all they really have done in that instance is create scarcity. That's another construct. So anyway, we're in a very, very, very interesting time right now. We're in an era that is nameless, but in time, more than likely, long after I'm gone, it will have a name. Hopefully I'll come back and find out what it was in another life. <laughs> but this push and this drive for racism to again reinvent itself from the old post-racial colorblind paradigm, this retooling, we're literally watching another retool and reinvent of this system. More and more people are beginning to talk about it in its systemic terms, which is interesting because they weren't for generations. And more and more people are starting to understand that it is, there are two things working in tandem, both the individual expression and the systemic institutional structure of it. More and more people are beginning to understand what it is, how it operates, and who is responsible. The who in responsibility 
are white people. Yes, you, if you're watching and you identify as white, you are singularly and collectively responsible for its maintenance and sustenance unless and until you begin breaking it down. Now, the best way to start breaking it down, white people, is to call it out when you see it. Don't be afraid to be called a nigger lover. Because that's what you're going to be called among a few other very, very nasty things. They call it tribalism. That's BS. That's BS. That's another dog whistle. Understand that in order to help bust this thing down, you have to dismantle your individualized expressions of it because it is those individualized expressions of it that keeps the cogs and the wheels moving and the white elite bank on you believing that bullshit about white supremacy and you being superior. They bank on that. The minute that you realize, just like my granddaughter's mother realized that it was racism that was trying to keep her off that plane, the minute that you realize that you are not superior, and that racism is, an inst is a series of structured institutions designed to keep people down so that you will appear to be up. Once you realize that, you can start dismantling all that individualized bull, which will, in effect, help to dismantle the system. Do that in conjunction with dismantling your economic class caste. You can do that. You can associate it. Because you need to understand what racism is just as much as any black person. You don't have to navigate your way through it because you don't live in it. But you need to understand what black people are navigating through, trying to work our way through all of the barriers that are set before us, because they're there. You don't see them because you don't live in it. So before I even digress any further into this thing, <laughs> I'm going to get off. I am going to go. I promise. Um, again, share, like, go to my, new, my YouTube channel, Dr. Cynthia Ali Smith. I actually have two. Go to the one that says the doctor is in. Okay. Because I created one a while ago when I was writing, when, when I had written a couple of books, a couple of novels. But this one, the, the doctor is in. You'll see it. It looks just like that. Just like that. Um, and subscribe. Okay? And uh, do share these videos. Share my essays. I thank you for listening. The doctor's about to be out. Bye-bye.